Dude, what happened to Rage of Angels? If you're like me, you have asked that question a thousand times at least since January 26th, 1989, when that band burst onto the scene with their awesome, I mean, literally, I think it's one of the best debut albums of all time. And then, after just a short time, they disappeared. They took the Christian metal world by storm. Everybody was talking about this album, man. I remember everybody's like, have you heard this new band, Rage of Angels? This album is awesome. I remember I bought it. I brought it to my dad's. I was a fresh at Anderson University at the time. I sat down in their back room there. And they had a you know a jam box, a stereo, something I could play CDs on. And it was one of those magical albums that had no skip tracks on it. The whole album from start to finish was just a big jam. But then it was like a bunch of confetti getting blown out of a cannon. It was like all this noise and frills and whoa, this is awesome. And then nothing. Crickets. You didn't hear anything. Where's the tour? Are they coming? Are they going to play? Are they even still a band? Were they ever really a band? Were they even a Christian band? Was this just a project? You know, there's all this mystery and crazy kind of misinformation and rumor floating around. And then eventually it all just turned into silence and nobody heard anything for like decades. Well, by a stroke of providence, not long back, I'm surfing around YouTube and I come across this interview with Danny Mariano, the lead singer for Rage of Angels. I actually found out he was the founding member. He's the guy that put it all together. Okay. It's a fascinating story. He's going to share with us how the band got put together, what happened through those early days of recording the album, and what happened after the album was dropped. It is a very interesting story, and I'm going to share it all with you coming up. Rocking you up for Jesus Christ with classic style hard rock music and practical Bible teaching. In an interview I found on the YouTube channel Area 312, and if you're not subscribed to Area 312, dude, you've got to subscribe to it. I'll put the link down in the description. But they did this interview with Danny Mariano, the lead singer, and as I discovered, the founding member, really the crux of the band, Rage of Angels. And he shares a very interesting backstory about the formation of the band and the abrupt breakup right around the time that their first album dropped. It was the late 80s. Danny got a hold of his good friend, Greg Kurtzman, who ended up being one of the guitar players in Rage of Angels. He came over to his house and they sat down and they started writing. And they wrote, Reason to Rock, It's Not Late for Love, and Leave You or Forsake You. They really felt like they had some Something with those three songs and they wanted to record a demo okay so they needed to fill out the rest of the band they weren't sure who to call so Danny reached out to three more of his friends he called Frank DiCostanzo John Fowler and John Maselli who was the original bass player for Rage of Angels but by the time they came to actually recording the album he had been replaced with Dale Glifford Danny said they all got together at his house he still lived at home with his parents who were very cool and supportive of the whole thing he started sharing the songs with them that he and Greg had written and instantly they began to sing the Christian vibe. They're like, what is this, man? And Danny said, hey, this, this is a Christian thing, okay? And he could, it's almost like he could kind of sense they were a little uneasy with it. And he said, at first I told him, hey, you can just be players, okay? Like trying to take the pressure off the whole Christian thing. As it turns out though, that conversation sparked more conversation and all of them, it turned out, had faith in Jesus. They just hadn't practiced it or been serious about it. Danny said those early rehearsals were awesome. Things were gelling. They were actually coming on board with the whole idea of the Christian message. They were growing as friends. They started doing some shows. Danny described the band this way. He said, hey, we weren't squeaky clean, but we had a message and we were proud of that message and we proclaimed that message and people were receptive to it. What's really interesting when you listen to this interview, it's like it was bigger than any of them. It's not like Danny said, hey, I'm going to form a Christian band and we're going to get signed and we're going to create this awesome album. It was all just kind of taking the next step as it came up before them. And the band got caught up in the whole thing and it started to move them toward seriously thinking about their faith. Danny's dad, it really sounds like, loved the Lord and wanted to nurture these guys who were really just kids. They were just early 20s. Danny told the story this way. He said, my dad came to us and he said, listen, guys, I think we can all see where this is going. In other words, it's starting to get serious. You're starting to get some attraction. You're starting to get some attention, even from labels. He said, you guys have a message. And then Danny's dad said something that I think is very cool and reveals his heart. He said, there are people who will listen to you in terms of your proclamation of the gospel who will never listen to me. So I think it's really important that you get acquainted with the word of God and that you add some understanding and some knowledge of God's word to your faith. He said, how about one night a week, Thursday nights, come over to my house. We'll put out a spread. We'll study the Bible together and we'll grow. And they were like, absolutely, man. And so they came, Danny said they brought their girlfriends, they ate and Danny's dad taught them the scriptures. And during the course of that season, all of them either committed their lives to Christ or recommitted their lives 
to Christ. Very, very cool. Danny said, we really all were beginning to understand that we were a voice of light in the darkness, that we were bringing the message of the kingdom into a world and there was an enemy and we needed to be strong in the Lord to stand firm and proclaim this well. Near the end of 1988, they were approached by a record label and they got signed. Danny said that we all were in the lawyer's office and it came time to sign. And at that moment, John Maselli, Danny's good friend who'd been playing bass in the band, he said, you know what? I, I can't do this. He said, I love playing. I love you guys. I love the music we're creating. I'm just not interested in getting caught up in the whole legal contract side of things. I'm not, I don't want to do the business side of it. And so he bailed out. That's when Danny reached out to Dale Glifford, who ended up being the bass player on the album. So the band was signed as Rage of Angels, and they went into the studio to record these nine songs that would become their debut album. The album dropped on January the 26th, and Danny said the band played a few shows there in their local area. They were all from the Northeast, Stamford, Connecticut. They were slated that summer to play at Cornerstone Fest. The album, of course, as we all know, was being super well received. Things were starting to happen. And then Danny shifted and he told the story of how and why the band broke up so abruptly. Okay, I'm going to drop the audio of his interview in right here. Listen to this. The guys in Steelheart, the band that John and Frankie ran to, those are our best friends. I mean, when I say best friends, I'm I mean, best, best buddies. We grew up with them. Chris Rizzola is John, or was Frankie's guitar teacher, even though we're all the same age. Me and Mike Matevich, still best friends. And um, here we were, you know, they had set us up for, and I, I brought this up last time, I can't remember if it was the Jesus People USA or whatever, like whatever the outdoor festival was that they were sent us to in Chicago. Cornerstone. 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 So we were set up to go there and uh, our trucks were loaded and Steelheart at the time was called Red Alert and Red Alert had just fired their drummer and they had a showcase going on with MCA Records at our studios. And the week before that they fired him, they said, please, could we just take Fowler, you know, Johnny and use him for our showcase? And we said, yeah, that's fine. And we joked, don't be stealing Fowler. You know, no, no, no. He's not, you know, Steelheart was phenomenal. Mike's a great singer. I mean, everybody in that band was great. They had awesome songs. I mean, you know, it stunk because we were right literally in the next room. It was our studio room and theirs was next to us. And we both owned those rooms. So every time we went to the studio every day, Steelheart was already there working on their material. And they'd always say, yeah, we got a part of your song in ours. I said, yeah, I said, I got a part of yours too. <laughs> you know, because it, it, it was just bleeding through the walls. Yeah. But, all that to say, you know, we helped them paint their stage. We got their light set up. They used part of our lighting that, but we were borrowing Queensryche uh, light stage, their trusses and their lights from that tour to bring with us. And just weird. I mean, they had their showcase and MCA signed them on the spot and they weren't coming out of their room. <laughs> and, and we're all sitting there and we're all sitting on the back of our trucks, you know, like, because we, we had to reload the trucks, so we're waiting for them to open up so we could put everything back in the trucks. And no, they weren't coming out a good few hours. I think it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. They all came out kind of sketchy, like, hey, don't be mad. And I said, what's going on? And John said, they just offered me a million-dollar deal. And uh, I put my name on it. He said, I signed. Heartbreak. And we all were just like, what? You know, like, no, no, yeah, yeah. He said, let's just, we'll talk tomorrow. John Fowler and I were best, best friends. I mean, best friends. We did everything together. So, boy, getting kicked in the teeth by your best friend. Like, here you've waited your whole life. The album sounds great. We're going to go out. We're going to do amazing things. And then let's get back to the devil. Who knows who had their hand in this? Boy, pulled the rug out from underneath me, gave John the million-dollar deal, you know, and he went home with a smile on his face, and we were like, now what? The question was asked, Danny, hey man, when those guys left, why didn't you just go get a couple guys to replace and continue on with the band? And Danny described it this way. He said, hey, you know, today, Christian musicians are just so much easier to find in that day in the Northeast. You just couldn't just go out and find quality Christian musicians. And so he said, you know, the whole thing just kind of came to an end. And so there you have it. In the words of the great Paul Harvey, now you know the rest of the story. I hope that rocked you up. If you like this video, do give it a like, hit that thumbs up button, click the share button, share it with your friends. I've got a link right over here to the entire Rage of Angels debut album. If you haven't heard it, you've got to check this out. Some of the greatest Christian 80s metal, man. Keep your eyes on Jesus and I will catch you in the next video.